Oh, I'm on. Sorry about that, guys. Technical difficulties. We solved it, though. Um, welcome to the ASV's August Astro Talk. Tonight, we'll be treated to a presentation on how Sarah Spencer hacked a domestic knitting machine from the 1980s to knit a giant equatorial map of the night sky. Her map called... Oh, Gavin's texting me. We're late. Sorry about that. Gavin, stop sending me messages. I'm trying to read. <laughs> Uh, her map called Stargazing is now on display at an exhibition in the State Library of Victoria called Handmade Universe. But before we begin, I would like to say that in the spirit of reconciliation, the Astronomical Society of Victoria acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Before I hand it over to Sarah, I just want to remind everybody that uh, our Sea Lake Astro Fest kicks off on the 29th of October, running through to the 31st of October. Well, technically the first, because there's events that Monday night. The Saturday public viewing night is booked out, 150 tickets gone. The Sunday night one, if you want to come along, there's less than 40 left, and there's just on 50 left for Monday night. So get in quick or you'll miss out. Uh, we've also just relaunched tickets for public viewing night at Caulfield Racecourse on the 2nd of September. It's for Friday night. Uh, the link is on our website and it will be on our Facebook page this evening at some stage. Now, Sarah has been a software engineer professionally working on websites for the better part of 20 years. That's about how long the ACs new website's taken. Potshotting myself there. Uh, in her spare time, she's an accomplished, whoa, an accomplished maker and tinkerer, having spent time on the board of directors for the London Hackspace and her, with her work being featured in many publications, both online and in printing, uh, including Physics World, Space.com, Make Magazine and Unraveling Women's Art. The floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you so much for that introduction, Mark. And um, and I have to say, I'm uh, I'm incredibly grateful for this opportunity here tonight to present to the Astronomical Society of Victoria. I've actually been following uh, you guys for a few years now. I even attended one of those um, stargazing nights that Mark mentioned at um, Caulfield Racecourse. And I did want to say that even though on the particular night that I went with my with my two young children, it uh, was overcast. But it, in the end, although we didn't end up stargazing, we ended up uh, telescope gazing instead, and it was still an awful lot of fun to hang out with you guys. So thanks again for um, this opportunity tonight. Right, I'd like to tell you a story about one very special map called Stargazing. As Mark mentioned, I hacked a domestic knitting machine from the 1980s and turned it into a network printer. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a lot going on in that statement, and I won't actually do any di uh, deep diving into this tonight um, because there's an awful lot of other things I want to talk to you about instead. But uh, it is the precursor to the stargazing tapestry uh, because I could not have made stargazing without hacking that uh, domestic knitting machine first. Um, but, uh, yeah, you'll see here at tinyurl.com, there's a link to a, um, a presentation I did specifically on the knitting network printer a mere eight months before stargazing uh, was unveiled. So um, you can go along and check that out. That's a whole 45 minutes right there just on uh, the uh, knitting network printer itself. But there's a photo of it, so you can see that it, it involves a Raspberry Pi, which is doing the network side of things for me. So I'll just move my cursor here. We've got the Raspberry Pi plugging into the old um, via a hacked... FTDI cable plugged into the old floppy drive port on this 1980s machine, um, which is basically converting the messages I send to it over the network into the old floppy drive format that the machine can actually understand. Uh, I also created a, um, a, a new color, a multicolor algorithm for this machine, which hadn't, hadn't previously been envisioned, which also um, enabled the star map to exist because previously you couldn't really do uh, uh, one nit per pixel in three colors using these old machines. And there's also a, a custom uh, designed circuit board here, which is automating the color changing for me as well. So there's, the, there's certainly a lot going on just in this picture alone. So there's 45 minutes right there at this tinyurl.com if you're interested. So that was, uh, yes, this is uh, so 2018. Uh, after doing this presentation, I, I, in fact, in this presentation, I did acknowledge the fact that I'd made a thing that can make things 
So I've got to make something with it, right? Uh, and I was looking for an opportunity to do something really spectacular with this piece of tech. And the opportunity came up, as, as I mentioned, just uh, only eight months later. Uh, Electromagnetic Field Camp in the UK. It's a camp that I'm personally quite familiar with, and, and, it, and it does um, sit uh, you know, close to my heart because uh, I've, I know the, the organiser of this event from when I lived and worked in the UK. Um, and it's essentially a tech, a tech festival. Um, and I'm not sure what happened to the microphone. It's still going, okay. Um, so this is essentially a, a tech festival where people come and camp in a field for the weekend, just over a three-day um, course. 5,000 delegates come, come to camp in a field. And there are talks, so it's essentially a conference as well in the sense that um, you know, there are talks in the two big top tents. So you can see here there's a, a red one here and a blue one. So the two big top tents do have talks going. But it's also an unconference in the sense that there's lots of um, things happening at the same time, which aren't planned exactly. But you know, when you get all these incredible tech experts you know, camping together in a field, there's all sorts of amazing things uh, that can happen just uh, just through um, being so close. So uh, it, there's there's some amazing tech that comes to this festival. So um, once when I was there, there was Barbot, which is designed to mix drinks on a conveyor belt by Nottingham Hackspace, wind-powered land crawling sculptures, and hacky soapbox races. Uh, in fact, in the in this event in 2018, I um, I hitched a lift in a giant hexapod called uh, ro hexapod robot called Mantis, created by Matt Denton, who was a, who also invented BB-8 for Star Wars Seven. Some really cool, mind-blowing things. So I wanted to use my Nini Network printer to um, create something, uh, something of this festival that was also quite extraordinary. And I thought, well, we're coming to this field, you know, camp in this field away from the cities, and a lot of the delegates will be coming from the cities. So I thought, why not take this opportunity to showcase a little bit of the signs that's all around us? Why not show them the stars? So that was the original idea and where stargazing itself was born. Um, so you can see here, this was the very first photo of stargazing. This, um, uh, uh, I actually uh, just put my son, son down for a nap and then uh, a couple of days before I flew out to the UK and unraveled it for the first time just on my, on my living room floor. And when I took this quick photo, I then posted to Twitter and, um, and on Twitter I said, um, after 15 kilograms of wool and over 100 hours of knitting, I'm finally ready to fly to the UK. I just need to pack the entire new universe into my suitcase. I'll see you all soon. And that went viral. I remember going to bed that night, and um, I think it, it like it got 50 likes or something. I thought, wow, 50 likes is fantastic. I've never been, I've never done anything that's been like that that liked so much before. That's great. And in the ensuing few days when I was in the air and at the camp, things went a little bit nuts. Um, it just seemed to go everywhere on the internet, which is fantastic, particularly picked up by um, a lot of people in the US, which, which was interesting. It, normally, things that are happening in a conference in the UK doesn't really cross over to the US as well. So um, the entire internet community really did um, go bonkers over this, which is really cool. Seven million impressions if you include the long tail today. All right. just. Taking a closer look now, as you'll notice, the um, tapestry itself, it's four metres wide by about three metres tall. It's a little bit bigger than my knitting network printer. So um, in order to achieve the size, I actually knitted it in seven panels and then I stitched, hand stitched them all together. It's a bit hard to tell because I intentionally wanted it to not, not be that easy to tell, but uh, you can kind of see it in this photo. If I show you here, there's one panel there. Two, yeah, you can see that there, three, and then in continuum. So if you go and see this um, at, at the State Library of Victoria and look really closely, you'll be able to see those panels. Uh, so as Mark mentioned, this is an equatorial map showing um, the view of the universe from Earth. You can see the Milky Way here is featured as this gray cloud through the piece. And then Earth's equator here is this white line showing um, the sun, Earth's moon, and all of the planets in our solar system. Uh, and, and because we, we've got the Earth's equator here, you can also tell very clearly for, for this particular date and time what uh, constellations were landing in the northern hemisphere versus the southern hemisphere. 
Uh, sadly, the map stretches the constellations at the poles to warp the night sky into a rectangular shape, which is a bit unfortunate. And I realise that this, this is a very old style of, of viewing the night sky. Normally, today, if you look at um, maps, etc., they are in that spherical view because that's our view of the night sky. Um, so in all fairness, the, the reason why I chose this shape was largely because I didn't have that much confidence with doing shaping on, on my knitting machine. And this was back in circa 2018. I'm a lot more confident with my knitting machine now. I, I, I can do that shaping. So I think if I were to do something like this ever again, I probably would uh, use that circular shape so that the constellations don't have to be skewed. Um, but in reference to that, basically what, what I'm saying there is that this Ursa Major is shaped very differently when you look at it in the night sky. It looks very different to how you'll see it in this map. And same for Octans as well. Any constellations that are that are near the poles, Hydras, etc. Um, and uh, yeah, you know that it's showing us a particular date and time because the planets of the solar system are, are, are depicted. And that date and time was 6 p.m. Uh, 6 p.m. 31st of August 2018 UK time, which was when EMF camp officially opened and stargazing was on show for the very first time. So I first started thinking about this about seven months prior and I did basically bake into the piece a very hard deadline that I had to meet and uh, I did actually meet that one. So you can also see here the source that I use, which is ianhoshifuru.jp. So I did use a Japanese source largely because they gave me the Creative Commons attribute with an attribution license. But I, I do also want to mention that this map has changed quite substantially since uh, the version I sourced from their website. Um, the version that they offer is, is a vector and I can't actually use vector graphics for my knitting machine. I have to use bitmap. So I had to, complete, I had to uh, transpile what is a vector graphic image and, and hand select um, the right pixels to get into a pixel shape. I also changed all the labels. So um, each knit is v is a is sort of a V-shape when you look at knitting, uh, which means some text is easier to read than others. So I actually created my own font, which takes takes the knitting shape into account and makes it as easy to read as possible. So all the labels are completely different. Uh, and also all the stars are shaped very specifically in there um, uh, to uh, reference the magnification table, which you'll see down here at the bottom. So all the sizes of the stars, or the shape that you can see that they make in the knitting is relative to the luminosity in the, in the, in the night sky. So the bigger the star in the map, the, um, the brighter it is in the night sky. And obviously this is, obviously this is a map of the entire universe, but only the visible portion of the universe, and that's what this magnification, magnification data tells us. So this map only shows us up to magnification five. So obviously there are billions and billions of stars out there, but um, this one is only showing us what we can actually see from Earth. Um, oh, I also changed most of the lines too. So I noticed that some of the lines on the constellations of the zodiac didn't match the way they're drawn in popular Western references. And I wanted this map to be easily recognizable for the general public. So I researched each constellation and chose a set of lines that uh, either seemed most popular or represented the meaning of the constellation well. So Pisces looks like Pisces and Phoenix looks like a Phoenix. All right, looking closer now, um, all 88 constellations are featured, but there are actually 89 labels in this piece. And um, there might be some clever cookies in the audience who can work out why that might be. We've got Serpens, which is the only constellation that is non-contiguous, is actually labelled both uh, the Serpens Quarter and Serpens Kaput are both separately labelled, which makes those 89 labels. Uh, you also notice the constellations are labelled with their scientific Latin names, except one. I knitted and assembled this piece in my home in Melbourne using locally sourced wool from the Bendigo Woolen Mills uh, with the intent to take it overseas. And I wanted to honour the fact that this is, is an entirely Australian made product. So which constellation do you think I elevated above all others? Yeah, maybe the one that's on our on our flag. <laughs> that's right, Crux or Southern Cross, which in this map you can find it here in the um, bottom right hand corner in the Milky Way. So that one's both has got both its um, Latin and its English names. All right, so it's wildly popular. 
I didn't expect that. Um, this is the piece on show at um, EMF camp. Um, it had a huge following. E delegates were following it um, even as they were arriving to, um, to the event. I had one um, astronomer saying that he was looking at the night sky for every, every night as he was travelling towards EMF camp in the UK. And he was telling me that the planets are aligning because I didn't tell them what the date and time was uh, before the event. And, and he said, the planets are aligning. I think I know what the date and time is, uh, which is really cool. Um, even at the conference there was, as I mentioned, it's kind of a, an unconference. Sometimes things happen when you don't really expect them to. So a, another astronomer, a different person altogether, actually uh, uh, had a, um, an impromptu astronomy lesson with a bunch of students. They all just agreed to meet up at one particular time, and, and he talked to them about the stars using the star map as a reference, which is really cool. I didn't know that was going to happen. I kind of wish I was there. Um, Right, so I made stargazing to inspire young minds in STEM. Um, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a software engineer by trade, but I really do strongly believe in all the sciences. And um, at, at the end of the event, and the, 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 being a technology event, it, it, it was very popular and, and, it, and it was marvelous. And uh, in the end, I, I um, stuffed it back into a suitcase and brought it back to Melbourne. And it actually just kind of sat in the suitcase for a little while, which is a bit of a shame. And I thought, well, it's not doing what I made it to do. It's not doing what its purpose is. Um, so I did have a little think about where it needed to go exactly. During the event, um, I did get a lot of offers for private sale. Um, but if it just went into a private collection, it still wouldn't do what it was meant to do, which is inspire young minds in STEM. It would just disappear. So I looked up the State Library of Victoria website and I noticed in their donation section they had a whole department dedicated to the preservation of maps. And I thought, well, hi, oh yeah, give that a go. So reaching out to the State Library of Victoria, um, they were so excited about it, which is fantastic. They'd actually already heard about it, which is amazing. Before I'd even donated it, they'd, they were aware of its, of its existence. And... Um, and when I mentioned to them that, you know, it's gone overseas, it's never actually been seen here in Australia, they were even more excited. Uh, so that's where the idea behind Handmade Universe came about. So State Library of Victoria, they um, assembled a team, an exhibitions team formed from the curation conservation teams, and they designed an exhibition with the star map as the centrepiece, which is a huge, huge honour. When I made the star map, I hadn't even envisioned that this would even be possible. Um, so Handmade Universe, from code to craft, and the spaces between. It has four key themes as part of the exhibition. It has crafting, coding, astronomy, and mapping. Other incredible artworks were brought together for this exhibition, including Kate Just, Anonymous Was a Woman. And you can see Kate Just here, from one of the other artists, as well as um, Uh, Lucy Simpson's Echidna Quill Necklace, which is actually on loan from Powerhouse Museum. Uh, this exhibition also created opportunities for artists to create new works, which is super exciting. In the middle of a pandemic, the fact that we can create opportunities for new artists to create new works for an upcoming exhibition was very cool. Um, things I didn't expect the stargazing tapestry to achieve. So Mandy Nicholson's work, Star Country, which represents the dreaming tracks of the Wurundjeri people and was made in harmony to wrap around my stargazing piece using colours, using the same colours as stargazing as in, terms, in terms of dialogue. So you can see here Mandy here as well on the pillars. There's other um, pretty incredible books from the State Library collections which are on display as well, which don't normally come out of, uh, of preservation. So... Uh, I believe Sir John Flamsteed's uh, Atlas is also on display in the exhibition. So with all these wonderful opportunities being created for this exhibition, the exhibition team gave me the opportunity to finish the star map. And by finish it, I mean I'd always intended to light up every star. Because <laughs> I'm not ambitious at all. Uh, so the piece was meant to inspire young minds in STEM. It wasn't meant to just be an artwork. It was meant to be an interactive experience and blow the boundaries between art and science. So in preparation for an exhibition, um, 
and with the conservation team waiting to preserve the work for 100 years, I had to uh, completely reimagine how a lighting sequence would work inside a piece of art that would be preserved for the long term. So circa 2020, two years and one child after going viral, I embarked on a whole new world of electronics. So the finer LED plan is a bit hard to grok in the large scale because photos don't really do it justice because it's so big. And for the longest time, it was in, in a space that was just about the same size as the piece. Um, so this is actually a prototype they created for the State Library of Victoria. They've, they've taken on board as part of their collection as well because when um, stargazing isn't available or not on display, it's in long-term storage. It, this becomes a, a piece that's uh, useful to have a dialogue around it if, uh, if it ever goes off and does other things after the exhibition. So um, the prototype does uh, illustrate how this works quite, quite nicely. And it, and it had to be approved by conservation first before I could work on the final thing too. Uh, so here we have, uh, again, a custom circuit board. We've got um, a ESP32 chip, which uh, on, a, on a board designed by Sion, who's an um, unexpected maker, a, lo a local Melbourne maker, which is very cool. And that is plugged into what uh, I like to call the backing fabric. So you can see here the knitting layer and that one of those seams, it's really obvious, the seam itself is really obvious in the, um, in the prototype because I, I, I didn't worry too much about making it visible in this one because it, it kind of needs to highlight how um, the seams in the knitting layer needed to uh, work closely with um, the LED layer. So when you take the knitting layer off, this is what it looks like underneath. So the electronics is a whole separate layer underneath the knitting, which um, can be stored completely separately with a different, a different set of um, uh, storage requirements to the knitting layer. So it's um, museum quality cotton, which is stretched over a canvas. And in the front here, you can see, you can't actually see any of the electronics yet. So these are eyelets punched into the, the cotton fabric. And you can think of an eyelet, it's just, you know, when you thread your sneakers in the morning, it's just one of those holes, open hole in the uh, fabric that's uh, keeping the hole itself preserved. And then through these eyelets, we have light wells which are poking through. And the light well is what takes the light from the back of the piece and channels it through to the front. And of course, knitting is full of holes, right? So I can just poke these um, light wells at, at, you know, through any point in the knitting itself and get that strong pinprick of light through the knitting. And you also notice that the, um, the seams in the backing fabric also correspond uh, neatly with the seams in the knitting, largely because when I made the seams in the, in the knitting, I actually nudged the stars ever so slightly left or right of those seams because I didn't want a star sitting right on the seam. So that made a, very, a really uh, useful um, rule to follow for the backing fabric, so no LEDs are ever actually sitting directly on the seam. All right, this is the back of the work. This is where all the electronic, electronics sit. So you can see these LEDs are all, um, uh, they're actually glued directly onto those eyelets uh, using super glue. And that's largely because super glue, although it's very strong, it's also very brittle. So if any of the, um, if any of the lights um, stop working during the exhibition or even later, later on, it's quite easy to just apply sheer force to um, a super glue to break that bond and then desolder any of the lights and replace them. Uh, and you can also see that um, they are on a uh, different sequence of strings. So this one has two completely independent sets of strings of lights. So there is no um, one point of failure for these uh, the strings of lights. They're, each panel is on a completely separate string. So worst case scenario, if there is a fault at really early on one of these strings, it's only going to take out one seventh of the lights at any, at, you know, if that were to happen. Uh, you also notice that the, um, the strings don't actually overlap at any point. So this is using uh, something called the traveling salesman problem. Um, and I'll go into more detail, you know, in, oh, I'm seeing one person nodding, that's great. <laughs> so I'll go into more detail on the travelling salesman problem later, but essentially the travelling salesman problem is about um, visiting every single destination and only visiting each destination once and getting, to every, and getting to every single destination in the shortest path possible. So that way we're using the least amount of wiring necessary to achieve the same effect. All right. So this is where the star map 
spent most of its time in preparation for the exhibition, just kind of sitting right in the middle of my living room floor and it just barely fit. <laughs> so it, it was fairly disruptive for quite a while, unfortunately. Um, I don't think I'd ever, I, I knew what I wanted to do, but I don't think I'd quite considered the space I had available. In, in all fairness, when we first put the, this idea for the exhibition together and I got approval for it, it was before a pandemic. So um, during a pandemic, in, instead of, you know, um, hiring a, an external space, it's actually a bit safer to just set it up at home. So you can see here, I've got the whole backing fabric ready to go. Um, I didn't actually end up creating all seven, sorry, all seven panels on the backing fabric, so six seams, largely because I actually found my fabric was wide enough to cover, you can see here, there's no seam here, and there's no seam on this side. So it was only um, five pieces for the backing fabric in the end, just because I had fabric wide enough to fill the space. But, um, right, so how did I do this? Oh yes, lots of pins. <laughs> I think about 500 pins in total at any one time I was using in order to transpile that image on from the knitting layer down to the backing fabric layer because you could see in the um, prototype it had all the lines drawn so you could very easily identify which LED was corresponding to which constellation, um, which is important when you're programming and also important when you're replacing lights, knowing exactly which one's which. So... I understand that in the exhibition, uh, it was never really, this layer was never really meant to be seen by the general public. It's supposed to be a, a hidden layer. But I was really conscious at the time that um, this piece is going to be preserved for over 100 years. So I was being very careful to be as neat and nice as I possibly could. Right, so once I got the image onto the backing fabric, I uh, went back to my traveling salesman problem. So traveling salesman is an NPR hard problem in computational theory in that um, for every point you add, it adds extra complexity on an exponential scale. So most solutions that I found for the traveling salesman problem, it uh, worked okay for, you know, 30 or 40 points. But I think the, the worst panel I had was, um, I think it was, oh, which one was that? I think it was panel six with 140 points. Uh, most algorithms that I came across was, wildly unhelpful. Um, basically, it would take, you know, years to, to finish computing. So I wish I could tell you that I solved the traveling salesman problem in order to do this piece, but I absolutely did not. I, um, I actually just um, divided and conquered. So I actually just broke down these seven panels into another three pieces, solved the problem for um, subsets of the pieces, and then worked out how they would fit together. Um, so you can see that I have um, my script done in open processing. For this application, I chose open processing because it's an excellent um, uh, graphic programming language, so it produces really useful graphics. Uh, in, in this case, something that I could quite easily use as a reference, uh, like a visual wrapping, mapping reference. So you can jump on that. I think that particular sketch, 1229915, I think that's like a portion of panel five. So you can actually just run that script and, and see how it computes. Um, from memory, it was a evolutionary algorithm. So for every generation, it was able to find um, a shorter path and a shorter path. So um, uh, basically, it would, it would, it would uh, connect the dots in one evolution, and then it would try again, a rand another random combination. And if that random combination resulted in a shorter path, then it would choose that as the winner. So through evolution, you could eventually find the shortest path. It's a very simple uh, overview, but this is the end result out of all of those uh, all those runs of the same same script. Right. Okay. Now that I knew where to lay the cabling, I could finally lay the cabling. Um, so that original processing script I used didn't actually account for the curvature of the cable. So you can see here there's a very defined curvature getting from one point to another point, and that's because um, of the the direction of um, the solder joints on each of those LEDs is very specific. So um, I didn't I didn't actually go back. So uh, I still ended up using the same output. You can see here that there is no curvature. It is just a very sharp angle. Um, but doing some quick, some very quick calculations, I figured out that it wouldn't add a huge amount of, of cabling by, by having this extra curvature. And it was still within the range of what's acceptable for the entire weight of the tapestry itself. So although it was a bit unfortunate, not as accurate as something I, I wish I'd considered earlier, it wasn't really a big problem. 
All right, so that was a lot of soldering. Lots and lots of soldering. Uh, right. Um, all right, pit of despair. <laughs> Um, in this photo, it's quite late at night, and I'm watching a um, live stream by Jonathan Oxer. I'm going to misquote John Oxer here. Uh, making, he likes to say that making 50 or something is the pit of despair. So you can just imagine where I was with 842 lights to solder, stuck at home with two preschool kids in the middle of a lockdown, daycares closed, and unable to call in help. Uh, for the non-parents out there, you can't really keep young children safe and solder electronics at the same time, particularly when those electronics are taking up the entire room. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure how we got through this. Uh, many long days were spent running after the kids, followed by long nights soldering. It wasn't easy, no. Certainly wouldn't recommend it. Uh, this was nearing completion. The really cool thing about this project though was the further I got, the for every little little uh, space of time that I found to solder another LED or three, the piece kept getting bigger and bigger and more beautiful. So it was actually a lot of fun to just, you know, um, solder with the uh, um, some test sequences for the lights running in the background. And although I didn't really share this with my kids very much because they were very young at the time uh, and tended to get sticky fingers into everything, um, it, it, the few times that I did share it with them, it was actually very cool because this piece is so much bigger to them or looks so much bigger to them than it does to me and looks so much more magical because I know how it works and, and they can't quite understand it just yet. So although it was really hard, in some ways, having this piece home and taking up our entire living room was also kind of magical. All right, I finished it. Woohoo! That was a big bit of work and a lot of soldering, but in the end, it did get done. Um, here we go. Okay, installation time. So, this was at the State Library of Victoria. Uh, getting all the bits and pieces for an exhibition together was astonishing and um, I have a huge amount of respect for the, uh, for the exhibition team at the State Level of Victoria for all the incredible work that they did leading up to the exhibition. So um, the installation of Star Map did end up taking about a month in total and this is where, this was day one, day dot for me. Uh, we had a, um, a build team who um, put together all the framework. So you can see in this photo we have... Um, like that, that wooden uh, frame that the star map is supposed to, um, the backing fabric gets stretched around and then stapled onto. So you can see that's the that's the, the full size um, frame sitting there on, on, on the ladder. And then just behind it, this is the display piece of the star map itself where it's essentially going to be stored. Um, and uh, yeah, right here is a giant, the, this giant hole is where the frame will um, uh, it fits into quite 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 nicely actually. Um, so the mounting, uh, this whole wall here, uh, was fabricated off site and brought in pieces to be assembled in the space. And same for my um, tapestry actually. For a long time, the actual knitted layer um, was being stored in the State Library of Victoria whilst I was working on the LED layer. It was actually in two separate pieces for most of the um, most of development, and it didn't actually come together until. Uh, we got to we got on site at uh, Victoria Gallery. So you'll notice that um, this display wall, it's not straight. <laughs> it's on a 45 degree angle. Um, and that was actually compromised with the conservation team. So they have a policy not to hang textiles for longer than three months due to gravitational forces having a degenerative effect on the fabrics. Um, but exhibitions wanted Handmade Universe to be on display for a year. So this 45 degree angle is what they agreed to to make the piece last long enough. All right, so how do we get it from the frame here to the, dis from the frame here to the display over there? All right, here's a video that State Library prepared quite conveniently for us.
very short, short space of time. <laughs> but I mean, that, that was quite a lot of work. Um, you could see us testing the lights. Um, I, I think it even skipped over the part where we're stretching that backing layer across the canvas and, and stapling that down. But you could see us testing the lights quite extensively um, and also laying that knitting, knit layer on top and then poking those um, light wells through the knitting, knitting being full of holes. Um, and also uh, we use this uh, really great platform, which was um, on loan, uh, or, the or the wheels and the, um, the side parts of it were actually on loan from um, the uh, National, National Gallery of Victoria. Um, and also around the edges, we even went around and once the, the knitted layer was on top, we actually went around and hand stitched with the conservation team, hand stitched those two layers together around the edges. That's, a, that's how the two layers are sticking together on that giant canvas. And then we lifted it up by hand <laughs> and then put it into position. Largely because we were thinking about using maybe like a cherry picker or something to lift it up for us, but it ended up not weighing a huge amount, fortunately, because it is just fabric. The knitted layer was 15 kilos by itself, I think. The wooden layer was 30 and in total is about 75, something like that. So um, not too heavy to just pick up and we figured it would be a lot more delicate process to just um, do it by hand. And that actually worked really well in the end. Uh, right, so one other sneak peek on the inside of this piece. So you notice that there was a, a big um, empty space there behind the tapestry once we lifted it into position. And that's actually intentional um, because it gives us access in and behind the tapestry itself. So if you go and visit the tapestry at the State Library of Victoria and you just duck around the right-hand side of it, you'll see there's a little door that's been um, drilled shut but if any of the lights break or anything goes wrong with the electronics, then we can actually get in behind the tapestry and, and fix it quite easily. So um, I took this little video. This isn't as professional as the State Library's um, video, but uh, it's my little shaky cam version of going into that little um, hardy hole and seeing in behind the piece. There it is. You'll see some flickering there, some of the lights are misbehaving. That was just panel six and panel seven was causing a little bit of trouble during installation, but that's all we've fixed now. But um, yeah, easy access all the way around to all the LEDs. Uh, in theory, they should last significantly longer than, than the duration of the exhibition, but you never know. All right. And there's a circuit board. As I mentioned, the Star Map is designed to inspire young minds in STEM. And for me, technology is a huge, huge part of that. So I, even though this is an art exhibition and a, um, yeah, and, and, and exhibiting the collections in the library, I did really want that, um, that piece of tech, that custom circuit board, which is controlling the whole thing on display in the front of the work as you know, the technology side of the, of the STEM piece. So it, it also has its own little screen too. So I had a little bit of fun with that. Uh, if you do go and visit it in the, um, in the exhibition, uh, you'll notice that uh, it, it's, this is just right, right in the very front of, so directly underneath the tapestry itself, it's just on the right hand side. And that screen shows, that the, shows what the circuit board is thinking about and it does have a few interesting things to say. Um, and other 
fun fun thing I wanted to point out is um, the lighting engineers, after I explained to them that the significance of their technology as part of that STEM, STEM story, they then uh, cast a tight spotlight on that circuit board, which was a bit delightful. All right. So building a unique interactive experience. So now that the tapestry itself could light up, the question was, how are we going to make it light up? And this is something that I've been spending uh, quite a few months of this year um, working on the interactive component or the, the experience for, for the end user. And the offering to users uh, was essentially threefold. Um, it was um, first impressions. So you can see here when you first walk into the exhibition, um, the first impression of the star map is that it is always alive. It was designed to always be alive. So after people have interacted with it, the star map itself remembers those interactions. And then it, when no one is in the exhibition and no one's there, it will dream about them. Uh, and also it's only ever dreaming about recent interactions. So every time you go and visit the star map, it's always showing you something different. Uh, and then there was the Linga Longa proposal, which was if you're engaged in the star map itself, um, the artwork and the science behind it, um, the opportunity to just linger that little bit longer and engage in um, interacting with the piece, and that's where the app really came into play. So we did a lot of user testing on this, particularly it's like in the State Library itself with the prototype, and through the user testing process, um, we, we saw two really clear user experiences. Uh, one was the people who really did engage with the science, were curious about the constellations, curious about the stars and the planets. So there is one side of the interaction, which is um, being able to click on the planets or, or use your finger to press on the planets, press on the constellations, just to read that a little bit more about them. Um, and these texts are a combination of the history behind the constellations and also a little bit of the science behind it. So I think, I think out of all these stories, and there's a story for every every constellation. I think out of these stories, my favorite is possibly Cygnus. And it says, um, in 1964, a region uh, uh, within the constellation was found to be a particularly bright source of X-rays, indicating a potential black hole. Back then, black holes were only a hypothetical idea. So Stephen Hawking bet a fellow physicist that it would be no such thing. But Hawking lost the bet, and Cygnus constellation became the home of the first black hole ever discovered. Just a little bit of fun there. I, I really enjoyed that one. So, of course, if you don't really engage too much with, or if you don't like to stand around just reading lots of text all day, there is a whole other offering that the Star Map presents. And that's the fact that it is a giant artwork. It is a giant light show. So the other side of the experience is to actually do your own art piece on the tapestry and send it off to the tapestry and, and have it display your light show that you've designed, essentially traveling through space using your own colors and using your own, your own um, bringing yourself essentially to, this, to the star map and seeing it light up in, in the stars. So you can see here, um, I got a lot of great testing done by my two little ones. Uh, so they were fantastic at uh, really testing that um, artistic experience. Um, obviously, too young to read, so they're really engaged with that um, with that art uh, uh, side of the of the tapestry experience. And that's really where the tapestry does come alive too. So when the tapestry is dreaming, it will actually go ahead and show you know the constellations that people have looked up recently. So constellation, constellation, then you know sweep of an art piece, and then constellation, sweep of an art piece. It really is quite spectacular. All right, um, and that third experience obviously is the coming back. So for people who visited the star map and they're coming back in, let's say with a friend or or just um, coming to sit for, sit and ponder if they if they work in the city or, or what have you, um, it, it's always changing. It's always different, uh, and that's because it's responding to the people around it. All right. So, in closing, the star map has been referred to by many as a work of innovation, but in the Western culture there still exists, even today, strong social conventions that tell us what we can and can't do. Boys can't knit and girls can't code. 
So I know this might sound a little bit contrived, but I genuinely believe there are thousands of amazing innovations still to be discovered out there that sort of the union between one social convention and another. So instead of telling yourself knitting isn't for me or I can't hack a mechanical device, well, what if you did? And that's everything. Thanks everyone for your time this evening. Are there any questions? It was quite a yarn, wasn't it? <laughs> there were some questions online. Yeah. One from YouTube. This is an incredible confluence of art, craft, and tech inspiring. What is next to your artistic ventures and exploration? I, I get asked that question a lot. And I do like to say that this time I do have some ideas, but nothing I can share, unfortunately. Ah, I'm sorry. Secret squirrel business. <laughs> and there's another one on Facebook. Here we go. How long did it take to run the processing script to get the shortest path for the whole work? Oh, that took a while. Um, like I said, it was seven panels divided into three, so what's that, 21? 21 different runs, and they weren't all perfect. Um, I took about a week, quite frankly. I just let it run, well, in like in total, but like it was running for, let's say, five hours per piece. So, yeah, I just let, let it sit there and think about the solution for me in periods that's, of time. That's quite a long time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, do we have any questions from the crowd, from the audience? We do, yes. Oh, someone who snuck in, I didn't see him before. Hi, Sarah, that was that was fantastic. So multiple disciplines, I guess, by the time you finish it, you then know what you're doing. But it, it took me right back to the 1980s because I used to work for a company called Whole Proof. And they invented this machine that sewed a sock with no seams on it. Lovely. And what came along was the America's Cup and the Commonwealth Games in Queensland. And they couldn't, they redesigned that machine to knit boxing kangaroo socks. <laughs> and I stood in front of this, I had to go out and pick up a monitor that wasn't working. I was told it was in the sock knitting room. And I sat, stood in front of this machine, watching it just continuously knit a sock with red gloves and this boxing kangaroo. And it was just amazing, it did not stop did not change pace. So you've taken me back, so I'm very interested to follow that link of how you hack the machine. That sounds amazing. Are you going to make one for the ASV? Sorry? Are you going to make one for the ASV? <laughs> yeah, we could. Yeah, we could. Yeah, if you need, need a knitting machine, i got some contacts. Um, there's actually some really amazing pieces of tech at the National War Museum as well in Geelong. They have um, sock-making machines and and a giant uh, uh, rug-making loom. Very cool tech. I do recommend going to go check that, check that out. Do you have another one on the internet? Uh, someone wanting to know, um, the starry sky that we see is a sphere. How did you make it into a flat map? Oh, well, that's um, going back to that Japanese uh, reference that I used. Um, it was just available as a flat map, although I had to, had to change a lot um, in order to make it work for my knitting machine. It was already kind of flat. But, um, yeah, having said that, it is also you can also source um, these maps uh, with that spherical view as well now. So um, I think, yeah, I probably wouldn't go the rectangle shape again. <laughs> go spherical next time. Any other questions? If not, I think that will... Um... Thank you very much for coming along. It was a wonderful talk. Yeah, very, thank you. Very technical. Very technical. There's a lot of, a lot of. I, I can't solder to save myself. So, <laughs> very, very impressive. That's thank for you. sure. Um, so, thank you very much. It was thank great you. to have you along. <laughs> and before we close it out for the night, I need to invite somebody up, Mr. Barry Cleland. Come on, Barry's been our librarian for. They pretty much a quarter of a century. Yeah. Yep. And he gave me a call this afternoon to let me know that uh, I'll give you a hand up, young man. So let me know that he's he's hanging the hanging the uh, the book right, the bookshelf up. You're hanging the bookshelf up. You're retiring. <laughs> you rang me to tell me. So here you go. Thanks for words. Yeah, I've uh, been a librarian since 1998 uh, when uh, uh, Michelle. Um, what's her name? Jennifer. 
gave, gave the job away because she turned 70. Now, I, I'm now turned 82, and I'm getting, I'm an old bugger, getting too old. And uh, so we, 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 we were looking at the old team, myself and the others in the team are all pretty old. We're, look, we're looking for a younger team to take over, and we've been successful. And as from tonight, the new librarian is Angela. Stand up, Angela. <laughs> Angela, Angela Nessit. Uh, she's a, a lot younger than me, that's for sure, thank God. <laughs> uh, I'm definitely getting too old. We need some young ideas to run the library. And um, there's others involved, um, um, Brenton, and there's a couple of others we're looking at too, isn't there? And apart from uh, Richie, who's helps out too, he's here. So uh, we'll, we'll, the library will be a bit, a, you know, look a, a, a running in a younger way than what we've been doing. And, and, and in the end, that'll probably be better, I think. So uh, I'm retiring us from tonight, but I'm going to help Angela, of course, which she wants. I'm going to help her. I, I, I won't be the librarian anymore. Right. Well, Barry, on behalf of the uh, Astronomical Society of Victoria, I need to thank you for your 25 years, essentially, of service as a librarian. You've done an amazing job. So, Barry, when you think about it, you've been librarian for a quarter of the time that the society has been running. That's seriously impressive. Very impressive. So, um, that's not really that good. That was that was easy to work out. Usually, I need a calculator. I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Thank everybody at home for watching. I um, hope you enjoyed the presentation. It was a very detailed, very interesting one that I'm going to go and check those links out. I'll let them know. <laughs> Barry's coming back. Sorry, I should have mentioned before. Um, the pandemic's been going for just over two years. And there's quite a few members have borrowed books two years ago and other things. <laughs> And, and haven't returned them yet. So those that have done that, will you please return them to the library? We, it's important. And we are going to, as soon as we finish here tonight, we're going to the library. After we have something that, we'll, I'll make a quick announcement, we're going to go to the library with um, Angela, myself, John Cavanagh's here. And, oh, <laughs> we'll take Sarah with us. <laughs> All right, and John DeCars will be there too, of course. And I presume Richie will be there. Well, yeah, he'll be there as well. Okay, thanks. All, right. all good. No, that's all right, Barry. Now, and to the members watching at home, he knows where you live, so return the books, all right? Uh, but once again, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Thank you for watching at home. We hope you enjoyed it. Smash the like button on Facebook, uh, YouTube. Uh, subscribe to us. Uh, every viewer that watches on Facebook and YouTube generates a small amount of income for the society and every little bit helps. And Barry, the other Barry. I'll talk about that after the stream finishes with you. Um, but until next month, we'll see you later.